As you turn to John chapter 8 and you look at possibly if you have the King James Version, then there shouldn't be any note there. But if you have the ESV, you'll see just above chapter 8. Mine has it just above chapter 8 there. The earliest manuscripts do not include 7 verse 53 to 8 verse 11. And then that whole passage is put in brackets in my ESV. Now, just to tell you before I read this, two questions that arise. The first, well, one main question arises then. If uh, the early manuscripts do not include this, does it belong in our Bible? And I want to answer that question with a, a definite and certain yes. This passage does belong in our Bibles. Why the brackets then? Why the brackets and why this note, the earliest manuscripts, do not include 7 verse 53 to 8 verse 11. I want to illustrate or explain this by hand of an illustration. If your grandmother were to finally give up her, let's say, bread pudding recipe, right, and all the grandchildren had to get a copy of that recipe. And so grandma decides, instead of her having to write it all out because she wears thick, thick glasses and she can't write anymore or she doesn't have a computer to type it out, she decides, well, set up a conference call and we will have a conference call and you each can take notes of the bread pudding recipe. And so then grandma gives from memory her bread pudding recipe, all the ingredients, the method for making it. And each of the... Twelve grandchildren takes notes of grandma's recipe. If you were to gather those twelve fragments of recipes together, do you expect to find them exactly copied the same? No, you don't. You, you expect to find similarities, great similarities, actually great overlap, because you expect all the ingredients to be there, the method to be there. But you don't expect every child maybe to write, maybe someone writes cup, one cup of sugar. One writes cup full out, one writes cup with a C, one writes cup with a K, one cup, one cup. So you'd find these various differences within that recipe. Now, if you were to go to each of those grandchildren's recipe books where they keep their recipes, if they would file it in a filing system. Let's say they file it in a, in a nice... Uh, ring binder. Do you expect to find that bread pudding under bread? Or do you expect to find it under pudding? Well, you see, it depends on which grandchild puts it where. Some grandchildren might put that between the bread and some might put it and file it with their pudding recipes. Now, a similar thing happened with the copying of scriptures. We should remember that in the days when scripture was given, there was no Printing press. Printing press only come, came in the 1500s. So how did people used to copy documents? By writing it out. And by writing these documents out, what would happen is, let's say the letter of Paul to the Ephesian church would go to the Ephesian church. They'd get a copy of Paul's letter, but they would also know that this letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesians, this is part of sacred scripture. It needs to be distributed to all the churches. And so they would take it and they would copy the words of Paul and keep that copy with themselves and send the original on. And so we have multiple copies of the manuscripts for the various letters, the Gospels, and even some of the Old Testament books that were kept together in this fashion with various copies made in various places that you would find them where there were a gathering of God's people. And so you would expect to find various differences within the way the scriptures were arranged in the early church. And so in your ESV, our ESV being a more modern translation, the King James was translated in the 16, 1600s, and the specific way in which the King James translated approach, translators approached the Bible, at that time the manuscripts that were available had no issue with John chapter 8. But as time went on, some discovered that in the earlier manuscripts that were later discovered after the King James translation, they've discovered that there were some earlier fragments of these documents 
that did not contain or did not include John 8. And so that just rose a question mark as to does it belong here in John 8 or is it possible that it ended up in John 8 in the wrong place? So the question then, does John 8 belong in the Bible? Absolutely yes. But there is some debate as to whether it belongs here. Maybe it belongs with a different gospel. But for now, I think I'm going to treat it as it stands in John chapter 8 in this passage. It was given. And not even the ESV writers dared to suggest to put it in a different place. So I don't think we have any good reason not to treat it as scripture belonging in this particular place. I hope I didn't confuse any of you. If any of you have any questions with regards to manuscripts and translations, feel free at Bible studies to raise that issue and let's explain it again and again. But there are many books read uh, or written on the subject and you can, um, if you're interested in such things, ask me and I can give you some resources. Let's read together now from John chapter 8. And so listen to God's word. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives early in the morning. He came again to the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst. They said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. As we open up this passage, you'll see I've entitled it Malicious Men and the Merciful Savior. Malicious Men and the Merciful Savior. So let's first give attention to the context of our text here. John 8 verse 2 says, Early in the morning he came up again to the temple. All the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. Jesus came to the temple. The people came to Jesus and Jesus sat down and he was teaching them. The context is not much different than you find today in the congregation here. We are all gathered and expecting to meet with Jesus through the teaching. Jesus comes to us in the spiritual presence in the church through the Holy Spirit. He is with us and he is teaching us. And we have come so that we may hear him teach us from his word. And so the folks who were sitting in front of Jesus were having the same expectations that you are having today in meeting Jesus through the teaching of his word. And so the atmosphere was quiet, just like it is now, where Jesus was teaching them and giving them instruction, and they were all sitting attentively. Now there was an interruption, an interruption in this teaching. If you would imagine a big interruption today in church, imagine this would happen and interrupt us today. So this was the interruption that happened. Verse 3. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst. Now, what do you know immediately about someone who is interrupting the teaching time? You see, those who are sitting and listening to the teaching recognize the importance of what is going on. Jesus is teaching. We are busy learning from Jesus. The scribes and the Pharisees show that they have no respect for the teaching time that Jesus is now engaged in. And so they drag this woman and they make a big commotion. You can imagine the kind of consternation that happened. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who has been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst. She is now made the center of attention. 
Where earlier Jesus was the center of attention through the teaching, now they have placed this woman as the center of attention and there is a shocking nature to her being in their midst. They brought a woman, placing her in the midst. John adds, she was caught in the act of adultery. They said to him, so verse 4 to 5, here is what they had to say. The words that they interrupted this teaching time with. They said, teacher. At least they're acknowledging him as the teacher. He was busy teaching, so teacher. But just like you would have a child in class, a pupil who doesn't respect the teacher, you, you all know perhaps that when you were in school, there was this one student, if he had put his hand up, you would roll your eyes already. Oh no, here it comes. Here it comes. He's just going to interrupt the teacher again. And so here they come, interrupting the teacher, and they say, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Imagine the shock of those who were seated at Jesus' feet. Imagine the shock. Whoa, why drag this out in public? Why drag this woman in front, pointing out to her and pointing out her sin in this very public occasion? And so, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? So what do you say? So through this question, what do you say? We see the true intent of the scribes and the Pharisees. What do you say? Through this question, they want to change and transform what Jesus is busy doing from teaching to becoming a judge. To pass a judgment. They're interrupting and saying, Jesus, stop teaching for a moment. We need you to pass judgment on something. Stop teaching. Pass judgment. And there is an urgency to their question. What do you say? They think it is more urgent for Jesus to pass a judgment now than to continue with this teaching. They want him to stop teaching and render a judgment. Now, what would you do in this situation? Let's look at what the Savior does. But maybe a couple of things just for background's sake. Maybe this is something that caught your own attention. The first thought that comes to my mind, and I hope it came to your mind as well. Who caught her in the act of adultery? Which one of those who brought her in the midst of the congregation and said, We caught this woman in the act of adultery. Well, who, who caught her? Who saw her in this act? Where are the witnesses of this crime? Right? It was a crime in those days to commit adultery. So where are the witnesses? There must have been witnesses because they know exactly the sin. They know exactly the person who did it. So where are the witnesses? The second point then is, what does the law of Moses actually say? What does the law of Moses actually say? Leviticus 20 verse 10 tells us the following. If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. That's the obvious question. She was caught in the act of adultery. It takes two to tango. Where's her tango partner? Where is he? Deuteronomy 22 Verse 22 to 24 tells us the following. If a man is found lying with the wife of another man, both of them shall die. The man who lay with the woman and the woman, so you shall purge the evil from Israel. If there is a betrothed virgin and a man meets her in the city and lies with her, then you shall bring them both out to the gate of that city. And you shall stone them to death with stones. The young woman, because she did not cry for help, though she was in the city, and the man, because he violated his neighbor's wife. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. And so from Deuteronomy 22, we see both the man and the woman caught in the act must be brought. And secondly, we see they must be brought to the gate of the city. Where did they bring this woman? In the midst of the temple. Into the sacred place. This judgment is reserved for the city gates. And Jesus was not sitting in the city gates to render judgment. He was in the temple teaching. And so instead of taking the woman to the gates, they bring her into the temple. 
And so they are certainly not brought into the temple for stoning because if they were found guilty, the stoning should take place outside of the city. So we see the maliciousness of these men. Maliciousness then is identified or described for us in the dictionary. The definition given is having or showing a desire to cause harm to someone. Having a desire or showing a desire to cause harm to someone. This was not just a desire that they had in their hearts. They were showing this desire to cause harm. And who was the target of their malicious intent? The first target of their malicious intent was Jesus. Look at verse 6. This they said to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. You see, their intention was not in the first place to put this woman to death. They wanted to put Jesus to death. They hated him and wanted to kill him. So they said this to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. But also, their intent was covertly malicious. Covertly meaning secretly. Or maybe not as obvious. They were not as obviously malicious, but it does seem a little bit obvious because they dragged this woman in front of the teacher and they said, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So their apparent maliciousness is toward the woman. But we know through John's note that their primary target was Jesus. But can you see that their maliciousness, there is no boundary almost to their maliciousness. In their hatred of Jesus, they don't care, on, care about whoever they need to drag in. We don't even know the name of this woman. We just know it's a woman caught in the act of adultery. Now look at Jesus' response to the scribes and the Pharisees. What was Jesus' response in verse 6? Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And boy, oh boy, if you were to open a commentary and try to read what people thought Jesus wrote on the ground, it would make your neck hairs raise up. We don't know what Jesus wrote on the ground. It hasn't been told to us, and if I can remind you, Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, the things revealed belong to us for our instruction, so the things that are not revealed, don't worry, don't speculate. The one thing I will say about this, when Jesus bent down to write with his finger, his actions were contrary to the consternation that was going on around him. You see, they were trying to pull him into this confusion that they have just created. They expect an immediate response of Jesus, and Jesus takes the time before responding. That much is clear. I also wonder if John was not possibly alluding here Jesus was writing with his finger. They had just appealed to the law of Moses. And the law of Moses, the backbone of that law is the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments were written with the finger of God on tablets of stone. And here we have Jesus Christ, the Savior, writing with his own finger. The only place we have Jesus writing anything with his own finger. So that's something we're thinking about. Maybe. Maybe. But don't make too much of it. The point of the text here is not to speculate over what Jesus wrote, but to see his calm reaction in the midst of the consternation, in the midst of the commotion. And they continue to press him. Verse 7. His calm reaction caused them to be more persistent. And they continue to ask him. And he stayed, stood up and he said to them, listen to Jesus' words in his response, let him who is out without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Let the, let the one, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Now how many of you have heard that verse quoted to you? Especially in the context where you have tried to reason with someone to say that's unholy behavior. That's sinful behavior. And then someone tells you, 
Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And what people mean by that is, they say, you can only judge me if you are sinlessly perfect. You can only render a judgment on my life if you are sinlessly perfect. And when people take that stance with me, pastorally people take that stance with me a lot of the time. Because as a pastor, as a shepherd, you need to point out people's sin. How do you call someone to repentance without pointing out their sin? Repent of the sin. Put on this holy behavior. Put off that unholy behavior and put on this holy behavior. And people love to say, let him who is without sin. And what they mean by that is the one who is sinlessly perfect. And then I tell them, I've got news for you. If you're looking for someone sinlessly perfect to judge you, you're going to wait until Jesus returns. And when he returns, your chance for repentance is done. It's finished. Because he's coming to judge. He's coming to render a judgment. Your time for repentance will be over. If you're looking for someone sinlessly perfect to call you to repentance, you're going to wait long. Jesus has sent fellow sinners, servants of the gospel. As Paul had said, he is the chiefest of sinners who's been given the greatest grace of all to preach the gospel of Christ. And so your pastors, preachers have been given this great grace. I'm not standing in front of you because I'm sinlessly perfect. I'm standing in front of you because by the grace of God, He has called me to be the instrument calling the flock of God to repentance and faith. And may God, by the Holy Spirit, work repentance and faith in your heart. You see, I have confidence that you will be transformed by the grace of God, not because I've never sinned, but because I trust that the Holy Spirit works in your heart. And because God is faithful to work in our hearts through the means He has appointed. So this is not what Jesus means then. In other words, Jesus is not teaching that only one who is sinlessly perfect can cast the stone. Jesus is not saying that someone who cannot sin should then step forward to stone this woman. He's not referring then to sinlessness in general. Because there's a specific situation in which Jesus is talking about the one without sin. This woman was caught in the act of adultery. And as we have said, where are the witnesses? Where is the man? So Jesus Words here, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone, is said with the specific background of the law of Moses, the very same law of Moses they appeal to. Let's learn. Numbers 35, verse 30, tells us the following. If anyone kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death on the evidence of witnesses. But no person shall be put to death on the testimony of one witness. There must be witnesses, meaning more than one. What this means is, if you were to stand and witness someone murdering someone else in front of your own eyes, and you look around and you see no one else who saw this crime, and you're the only witness to testify, According to the law of Moses, that testimony would not stand because there's only one witness. One witness. No person shall be put to death on the testimony of one witness. Deuteronomy 17 verse 2 to 17 reiterates the same point. Reading from verse 2 of Deuteronomy 17. If there is found among you within any of your towns that the Lord your God is giving you a man or a woman who does what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God in transgressing his covenant and has gone and served other gods and worshipped them or the sun or the moon or any of the hosts of heaven which I have forbidden and it is told you and you hear of it then you shall inquire diligently. Notice, you shall inquire diligently. 
diligent inquiry must be made, must be established. And if it is true and certain that such an abomination has been done in Israel, if the fact of this has been established, then you shall bring out to your gates that man or woman who has done this evil thing, and you shall stone that man or woman to death with stones on the evidence of two or three witnesses. The one who is to die shall be put to death. A person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. Now listen to this. The hand of the witnesses shall be first against him to put him to death. Standing as a witness in the days of the law of Moses meant that if you witnessed the crime, you were responsible when it comes to the stoning because you believe in the truthfulness of your testimony to pick up the first stone and to start stoning. So in other words, you cannot be a willing witness if you're not willing to pick up that stone and throw the first stone. You had to be so certain of your witness and your testimony. And everyone else following your witness and your testimony, everyone else is stoning because of the basis of the testimony of the two or three witnesses. The witnesses have a great responsibility. Do we still have this sort of responsibility in the New Testament? As witnesses of the sins of people around us? Yes, we do. We'll get to that in a moment. But just keep it in the back of your mind. This is not just interesting information about the Old Testament. There's a New Testament application. It carries over, especially in the teaching of Jesus. In Deuteronomy 19, <clears throat> verse 15 to 21, we have it reiterated. A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two or three witnesses shall a charge be established. If you only have one witness, you're probably dealing with gossip. If you only have one witness, you're possibly dealing with gossip. Now, verse 16 says, If a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, if a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to, be dis to the dispute shall appear before the Lord. Here we have malicious witnesses in John 8, and they have actually brought themselves before the Lord. You see, they were standing before Jesus. Here were the scribes and the Pharisees and the woman they brought in front and they were bringing her to the Lord. They presumed that the Lord would judge this woman for her sins because outwardly she's an adulterer. They're the religious leaders. They're the scribes. They're the Pharisees. They're the in crowd. So the woman and they appeared before the Lord they were obviously malicious witnesses. Both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who are in the office in those days. The judges shall inquire diligently. And if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother. You see, if a malicious witness came up and a malicious witness said so-and-so, Murdered, and the punishment for murder was to stone that person. If the witness testimony faltered, that witness was put to death. Because he intended for that punishment to come upon that person. And if he lied, if he bore false witness, or if he maliciously pointed the finger at his brother, then the same judgment came to him. If the witness is a false witness, has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and the rest shall hear and fear, and shall never again commit any such evil among you. Your eye shall not pity, it shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. 
So in other words, what is Jesus saying then when he says, let him who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her? He's saying, let the witnesses step forward. Let the witnesses step forward and stone her. You've already rendered judgment and said this woman was caught in the act of adultery and the punishment is stoning. You witnesses have already decided the, the charge is established and it's definitely so. You've, you've made the judgment. So Jesus is saying, let him who is without sin here, let him who is without fault in all of this, let the witness then, in other words, step forward and stone her as the law commands. Jesus is, in a sense, calling out their bluff. Jesus was calling out their bluff. Come on, witnesses. Step forward, witnesses. Jesus is challenging then the evidence that they presented. Let the witnesses who were, are without blame, let him who is without sin, let him who is without blame, step forward and stone her. You see, the scribes and the Pharisees were already in violation of Moses in their attempt to entrap Jesus because they didn't bring the man. They only brought the woman. Jesus calls out their hypocrisy. And what lesson we learn here in Jesus' response is, Jesus is indirectly teaching us, you cannot hold others to a standard that you are not upholding yourself. You cannot expect others to live to a holy standard while you yourself are exempt. You must uphold that standard and within that standard call others to holiness. You see, and this is our work as a congregation, as church members. When we call one another to holy living, I'm not calling you to something that I'm exempt from. I'm calling you to something which is a burden on me as well. Matthew 11, Jesus said, All who are weary and heavy laden, come to me. Take my yoke upon you. I'm calling you to take up the yoke of Christ as I have taken up the yoke of Christ. I'm calling you to take up the call to holiness as I have taken up the call to holiness. Have I done so perfectly? No, not at all. Do I expect you to do it perfectly? No, not at all. But we're expected to do it. Will you do it? You see, if we become angry at those who call us to this holy standard, to this holy way of living, we are being just like the scribes and the Pharisees. Because they were angry at the hypocrisy that was called out. You see, why, why all this anger? Why all this hatred toward Jesus? It's not, nothing to do with who Jesus was, but with what he confronted them with. It was their own sinful hearts. Their own malice, their own hypocrisy, their own hatred. They had thought, we have arrived, we are okay. You see, the actions of the scribes and the Pharisees are self-condemning. They've acted in a self-condemning way. But you see also the mercy of the Savior here, not only toward the woman, but also toward the scribes and the Pharisees, because he didn't pronounce a judgment on them. He called out their hypocrisy and the shame of openly calling out their hypocrisy was a harsh enough punishment at this time. But the mercy is there that they still have time to repent. As some of them did, we know that Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, will see his response. So Jesus was demonstrating that their actions are self-condemning. Now, I believe, in our text then, after Jesus had said this, the commotion must have died out as it dawned on Jesus' opponents. Skakmat, checkmate, he's got us. 
So I think here silence was dawning on them. And in verse 8 we see, And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground, waiting for the next move. The silence must have felt heavy like the silence. Heavier than the silence now feels. So that they could think. And then in verse 9. When they heard it. They went away one by one. So in the silence. Just one by one started turning away. Leaving. Beginning with the older. Beginning with the older ones. It's generally those who are older, wiser, have more experience to know. This is the wisdom of Jesus. He is right. The young ones might have still hung around, taking a moment for this to sink in. It's not, the, older, the older folks are normally quicker with their brains. Didn't mean anything malicious by that. Then we see the contrast with the merciful Savior. Merciful means here a willingness to be kind and forgiving towards someone who is undeserving. In verse 10 and 11 we read, Jesus stood up and he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Where are they? And Jesus here is probably being a little bit sarcastic. He's acting as if he's surprised. don't think he's really surprised, but... Oh, woman, where are your accusers? A few moments ago, there was a great commotion because of your sin. Where are they now? Where are those who wanted to stone you? Where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? Has no one condemned you? And for the first time, this woman speaks. And I wonder what weight she felt in her heart and in her soul when she said this. I think she's looking around as the realization dawned on her, no one. No one. No one, Lord. No one, Lord, but also the pounding of her heart because here she is face to face with the Lord, with the teacher in the temple. No man spoke like this man. Face to face with Jesus Christ, her heart pounding because what is he going to do? Because he knows all things, he sees all things. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. Soft, kind words of the Savior. Neither do I condemn you. But with this soft and kind voice, He also calls her to repentance. Because no doubt, she is a sinner. And it is most likely that she was guilty of the sin of adultery. But the circumstances of dealing with that sin by the scribes and the Pharisees was to condemn a soul to hell while letting the other party go scot-free and while they themselves as, wit as witnesses against this woman and this other man also get off scot-free and lightly. Because their goal was not to purge the evil from their midst or from their heart. Their goal was to entrap the Savior. And so, Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and from now on sin no more. These words that Jesus asked, has no one condemned you? Has a sense of irony to it as well. Because the Savior would at the end of this gospel stand condemned by men. An innocent man condemned to death. So that we might live. He would take our condemnation upon him. So that as Paul writes in Romans 8. And with this we close. Romans 8 verse 1 to 8. This is our condition in Christ. Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. 
For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And so, dear brother and sister, receive the words of the Lord Jesus Christ as this woman had received it. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And even for those who have in their hearts the same sort of maliciousness or sin or hatred for the Savior as the scribes and the Pharisees did, I wonder if some of them might have hung around, if Jesus might not have turned to them also to say, Neither do I condemn you. Go and from now on sin no more. I think the implication is there that when we turn away, Jesus', Jesus words remain true for us. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. What will you do when you hear the Savior's word, there is no condemnation for you? Do you go on sinning? May it never be. May you give yourself to holy living Repent of your sin, put off the old man, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self. Let's pray. <clears throat>